and she's doing more and more challenging work. She's recently, as I said earlier, been in Tibet producing special reports from there. But first I want to ask her about the ill-fated, or was it, visit of Antony Blinken to Beijing. I hope she's able to answer that. Li Jingjing, welcome back on the Mother of All Talk Shows. I promise you we'll get to Tibet, but I was struck by the uh, five-star welcome, uh, the red carpet, the military parade uh, that the Prime Minister of Bermuda got uh, in China just the other day. Uh, the level of respect afforded her was uh, terrific to see. I'm not sure she would have got that kind of a welcome most anywhere else. And then I compared it to the, well, rather sparse welcome uh, that uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State of the United States of America, got when he arrived in Beijing. Not only was there no red carpet, there didn't seem to be anyone there even to help him with his bags. Uh, what did all that mean? Thank you, George, for having me again, and thank you for your wonderful introduction. You know, I mean, it's understandable with the the reception that he got. Uh, you know, I think although Blinken always say his mission, his visit is about to repair the relationship between China and U.S., I doubted their sincerity and the capacity to actually do that. And there are a few signs. Uh, for example, every time the United States officials trying to repair something, they will release this, um, uh, how to say, traditional repertoire, this concerted campaign uh, of releasing some damaging information to hype the China threat. I can give you a few examples. For example, Blinken was supposed to visit China in February. And right before his visit, we started to hear the Chinese spy balloon story, right? They shoot it down with missiles. All the US media uh, uh, use front page coverage for that balloon for, for, for a week, over a week. And after they, sh they shoot it down, like a month later, did they still haven't released any information about that. What have they found have, uh, from the debris? What device is China using? We haven't heard that. Just about just the hype. So and so Blinken canceled that visit in February. And then this time, uh, when Blinken was supposed to visit, on the eve of Blinken's visit, the Wall Street Journal released this another huge allegation that China and Cuba was building this spy base in Cuba. And uh, uh, like they accused China and Cuba was supposed to uh, do the eavesdropping on the United States. Again, no solid proof other than some anonymous U.S. officials. And Cuba denied it, and China denied it, Pentagon denied it at first, but now U.S. officials also just play along with this uh, concerted complaint. So this is a very, how to say, time-tested ploy uh, that's, that always works. Uh, so they will release some damaging information. The leaks always comes from uh, certain U.S. officials or those in the intelligence. So this is their strategy. So they do that before the visit so they can force the president uh, into a more hostile or confrontational way on foreign policy, uh, derail any effort to reduce the tensions. And uh, those people at the Capitol Hill can also just charge the presidents as you are being soft on China. Uh, you should take a tougher action. So, and uh, there's another political stunt. Before Blinken's uh, the so so uh, so-called two visit, during uh, just a few weeks ago before Blinken's visit in Singapore, the Shangri-La dialogue, uh, the U.S. for defense uh, defense minister Aloy Austin um, said they want to talk to China's defense minister because the communication between the two countries' military is canceled due to the U.S. Uh, recent provocations over the Taiwan Strait. So there were no communications, and Lloyd Austin pretend that he wants to talk to China's defense minister 
uh, and then all the media start to say, oh, wow, you know, China's defense minister canceled, rejected our invitation to, to sit down, to have a meeting. See, the Chinese don't want to talk to us. But the thing is, they, they, they don't mention that the, the U.S. put sanctions on China's defense minister. And right before the visit to Singapore, Biden again said it. He refused to lift the sanctions on China's foreign minister. And then somehow they, when they go to Singapore, they pretend we are friendly, we want to talk. If you want to talk, just leave the sanctions. And meanwhile, they also send U.S. warships into South China Sea, um, warplanes as well. The some CNN reporters, CBS reporters, were in the U.S. plane, uh, making the story. Oh, see, uh, Chinese pilot are so aggressive. They intercepted our plane. This is so provocative and unnecessary. But again, they also don't ask why are you. 8,000 miles away from your own border in our doorstep. Uh, and it basically just 100 miles from our borders. So it's it's understandable that Chinese military will take some action to defend the border. So if you put all this information, all this event together, you know, there's a, like I mentioned earlier, tested time-tested um, skill, time-tested ploy, which is a concerted campaign uh in order to damage any move any um, any move to repair the relations so even before his visit i don't see the sincerity and the capacity of the u.s officials to repair the relationship between china and the u.s now uh, the economic warfare uh, that uh, the united states seeks to encourage others to engage in uh, with china is having mixed results. Uh, the Italian Prime Minister made a quite shocking uh, attack on China that I read today. Uh, she said that China was a systemic challenge uh, to the European Union, uh, whereas Germany and its leadership seems to view China as an important partner uh, for the EU. Uh, President Macron is somewhere in the middle. When he's in China, he's as sweet as pie uh, or as lychee. Uh, but when he's uh, back in the councils of Europe, he can often be heard uh, echoing the uh, Biden White House talking points on uh, China. H how far do you think the European Union is likely to follow the hostile line of the United States on China? Um, if I think from the perspective of European countries, it's understandable they think China is a systemic challenge because mm -hmm. China is has a different system, uh, they look different. And um, so when now China is rising, they don't know what to do, what's gonna happen. So I can understand that. But the thing is, now we are more integrated than ever. We cannot uh, separate from each other. Only by working together can uh, we all have a better economy. And if you look at what's happening in the world, actually it's pretty clear. Um, I don't know whether you noticed the recent news. Uh, for example, Chinese leaders have been meeting, uh, visiting foreign leaders almost every week. Just this week, the leaders from Barbados, from New Zealand, from Vietnam, Mongolia are all visiting China uh, because they are attending the Summer Davos Forum in China's Tianjin city. So uh, they are signing new deals, uh, signing new agreements, upgrading uh, comprehensive strategic partnerships. And every, uh, before that, leaders from Latin American countries like Lula from Brazil, um, uh, also set leaders from Cuba and uh, leaders from African countries like Eritrea, DRC, they all visited China. They all received red carpet welcome. And uh, it's, it's so if some European leaders or US leaders think, they keep saying China is aggressive offensive coercing other countries into into some following China's foreign policies. The thing is, if you look at the news and look at their reactions and listen to their talks, they are all very willing to work with China. And there's so much respect from both sides. Chinese leaders respect 
those leaders, and those leaders also so happy to come here respect Chinese leaders. So if China is so aggressive, is so coercive, and so not respecting, why are all countries lining up to visit China and sending new deals or new agreements with China? And why are they uh, pivoting away from the U.S.? If U.S. is such a good partner, why they don't, why don't they stick to it and start to look for a new partner? So I think that already says a lot. Well, so I think in the yeah, yeah. I and think no, in the future, and, and, Europe uh, no, and no, China no, will no. work together. Hmm. Nobody could have said it better. Uh, let's uh, turn to Tibet. I was much more vicious about the Dalai Lama than I could possibly encourage you to be because diplomacy is not just in your character, it's also in the Chinese character. But I think it's fair to say that Tibet is utterly transformed and it is unrecognizable to the picture of an oppressed, a religious enclave, uh, beloved of Hollywood liberals and, and liberals everywhere. You've just been there. Tell us what you found. Mm. So as a reporter in China, I've traveled to regions like Tibet and Xinjiang multiple times in different years. So I feel so lucky to witness the dramatic changes in those regions over these years. And uh, because I always interesting to see how the poverty alleviation program carried out in the local level and how it changed the lives of, of ordinary people. So the West uh, care about Tibet so much, right? It's always on the news and they keep seeing how oppressive that region is. But uh, I think there, uh, there are many videos and images on my account so people can take a look with those pictures and videos are without filters, BBC filters. <laughs> Uh, which we call it, it's a term, BBC filters. So whenever BBC make a story about China, they always make everything darker. The trees, not so green, skies are not so blue. Somehow, like we, so now we call it BBC filters. So I can give you three data about uh, Tibet to give you a glimpse how dramatic, dr how dramatic the changes are. Uh, first Please. is the regional GDP. Yeah. So in the past 70 years, the regional GDP of Tibet increased by 300 times. So in, in 1951, Tibetan people basically had nothing. They didn't have their own land. They didn't. Oh, uh, the, many people don't know there's a feudal serfdom, theocratic system in Tibet. So those who fled to most of those Tibetans who fled to other countries are the nobles uh, who own 95% of the people in Tibet, in Tibet because they think they are their serfs and they own 90% of the properties, natural resources in Tibet. So the 90% of people in Tibet didn't have anything in 90, before 1951. So the original GDP in Tibet increased by uh, 300 times. The second data is the average life expectancy. In 1951, the average life expectancy of Tibetan people was, was 35 years old. 35 years old. I'm 35 years old. If I was born in Tibet, I would be dead already. But now the average life expectancy in Tibet is 75. That's the normal age that we see today. So that's the life expect expectancy. Third is the, uh, uh, although so many data, uh, which one should I, should I bring? Uh, how about the illiteracy? Uh, because basically in before 1951, the majority of people, almost all Tibetan people were illiterate, except for those nobles uh, who have serfs, they had the privilege to go to school. The majority of Tibetan people were illiterate, so there's no cultural preservation before uh, in Tibet back then as well. But now everybody went to school. Everybody know a little how to speak and write. And um, in China, we have nine years of compulsory education where like all of us, we have to go to school, uh, like kindergarten, primary school, middle school, high school, it's nine years. 
but in Tibet and also Xinjiang, it's 15 years. 15 years of compulsory education, all paid by the government. And in other parts of China, like us, we still have to pay the fees for all the textbooks. We have to pay for the food, for the meal in school. But in Tibet and Xinjiang, kids don't have to pay anything. All meals are included. All textbooks are included. Just go to school, 15 years from kindergarten to high school. So these three data show the dramatic changes in Tibet in the past 70 years. And also I went to, because some the anti-China crowds and the separatists, they keep saying, well, Tibetans cannot speak their languages. Uh, they, can, they don't have their religious freedom. They cannot do this. Uh, their culture is being destroyed. It's totally on the contrary. Because of they are going to school, they are uh, have they have better economic status. Now they are able to protect their cultures. Many of the their traditional uh, culture, for example, they have very special drawing art tanka. Um, now they revive the lost te uh, techniques and then form the school and start to pass it on to younger generations. I went to Tibet University. They have this research center where they kept all the scriptures of Tibetan Buddhism and the re religion before Tibetan Buddhism arrived and uh, the classics of local intellectuals from hundreds of years ago, centuries years ago. They preserve that and study that and digitalize all those manuscripts, all those classics, so they can continue to study. So it's actually because of the policy that China is, is putting on Tibet now that those people can finally have the freedom and uh, can continue to pass on their culture, pass on their, their traditional arts, and uh, you know, many who are working in the government levels in different organizations actually who used to born, who were born from the serfdom family. Those people had no future when they live in the old Tibet. But now they are working as cadres in government, as government officials, uh, have their own businesses, have all their own lands, send their kids to school so they can forever change their life. So this is the real Tibet that the Western mainstream media never tell people.